Welcome to Centerpoint. We are excited we get to worship together this morning. Start to make your way into the worship center because worship will begin in just a few minutes. Every Sunday, we partake in remembering Jesus' sacrifice through taking communion together. If you are a follower of Jesus, please pick up a communion packet on your way into the worship center. If it's your first time with us, either online or in person, we want to say a special welcome to you. We'd love to connect with you, answer any questions you may have, and share more about our church. Please scan this QR code to fill out a guest information card. At the bottom of the card, we have listed six local partnerships. Choose the one that resonates with you the most, and we will make a donation to that ministry on your behalf as a way of saying thanks for being our guest today. Our mission at Centerpoint is to help people find and follow Jesus. For those who are regular givers and are serving here, it's your contribution that helps lead us toward that mission. We want to thank you. There are three ways you can give to the mission here at Centerpoint. On our website, on the Church Center app, or in the white offering boxes on your way out. Before worship begins, take a minute to see what's happening here at Centerpoint. Hey Centerpoint, in January we collected a ton of coats while partnering with Serve City. Now in February we're going to be collecting school supplies for Project Minyana. This is just one simple way that we can show the love of Christ to others locally and globally. Come find out more about joining our June mission trip to the Dominican Republic with partner ministry Project Minyana. We partner in all kinds of ministry with Project Minyana, from serving kids and families through schools and medical needs to prison ministry. Whether a seasoned missionary or considering venturing out into foreign missions for your first time, you'll fit right in and find your fit on this trip. Join us for a monthly night of prayer and worship with our church family. The elders are meeting on the second Monday of each month in the multi-purpose room for a time of prayer and worship. Join them between 6 to 7.30 p.m. in person to pray for local and global concerns of the kingdom and spend time worshiping with others. Introducing Core Classes, your next step after next step classes. Centerpoint would love to partner with you in your journey of following Jesus and growing in your faith. We are offering two classes, What Christians Believe and Bible Basics. You can attend adult worship at 9.15 a.m. and a core class at 11 a.m. To learn more about our upcoming events or to register for any event, please use the Church Center app. To stay up to date with all the happenings at Centerpoint, follow us on social media. Good morning. Hey. Happy Super Bowl Sunday. That matters to some of you more than it does to others, I see, because I could really care less. Uh, most of us are dressed for how we care about this, except right, you're sporting it. I like that. That's good. Cheer for your team. Uh, I'm just go Reds. That's where I'm at. So. Thanks for being here. If you are brand new with us uh, today, we just want to say a special welcome to you. We'd love to get to know you and to give you a little information about us. The best way to do that is to scan the QR code uh, on uh, the screen. That'll take you to a form that you can fill out. At the end of that form, we list uh, four ministries, local ministries that we partner with. You can pick the one that resonates with you the most. We'll make a donation to them on your behalf just as a way of saying thanks uh, for being here today. Every few months, we highlight, spotlight a certain ministry here at Centerpoint. And this month, uh, Ben Graham, our executive pastor, sat down with Scott Watkins, who is our missions coordinator, and they talked about what's going on in missions here at Centerpoint and how you guys can get involved. So take a look at this video. What are you seeing that 
is kind of center point making a difference here and internationally. Things that are right in front of us uh, as a church are our contribute campaign. So when people within this church contribute to center point and to the mission of center point, what they're doing is contributing to the mission of center point locally, nationally, and internationally as well. We talk about being new here and going on the app and filling out the new here form. At the bottom of that form, we give them the opportunity to choose one of our local partners so that we can make a contribution to those partners. Yeah, and so that's kind of like step one, right? That's just getting people a little hint of this is something we care about because that's part of changing the culture. But then we want to be uncommonly generous as a church. And so you know, we've been talking about this for a while, but I mean, really your heart for people, that's the culture we want at, at center point for all of us, that we just have this desire to go out and love people because we've been loved by Jesus. And we do that by helping them find and follow Jesus. We contribute to the mission. So we had a group that recently uh, came back from Dominican Republic, the women's trip, the women's conference, 10th annual women's conference down there. Uh, we have another trip that goes to the Dominican in June and a student trip that will go to Dominican in July. This is the first student trip we've done in a number of years. So this is really exciting to be able to see them go. And then there's the stuff that we aren't even sure about yet. So like our, our March Ghana trip, which is just kind of a vision trip, is hopefully leading to another trip for whoever may be called to go in the fall. Another way is to just email us at missions at cpcc.church or go to cpcc.church slash missions and reach out to us and connect with us and let us know that you want to be involved in missions so that we can get you out there on missions. And it all starts really with praying for people where you live, work, and play. Yeah, we are committed as a church to increasing our opportunities for everyone here to get involved in contributing to the mission. Your job is to step in. Why? Love is why. See? That's so good. Hey, we're going to continue this morning by worship. If you guys would stand up with us. Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand, and everything around me is shaking. I've never
are safe, that you won't fail. We put our trust in you this morning. honor you and we thank you, Lord. God, you will never fail. You are always good. You remain the same through our trials, through our tribulations, but also the highs, Lord. You stay the same in all situations. And we honor you this morning, Lord. We love you and we thank you. It's your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you all for worshiping with us. Uh, please say hi to some folks around you before you grab a seat this morning. Hey, just a couple of things before uh, we get started that I, I need to highlight. First is the, is the map outside in the lobby. Did you guys see the map o- over here? So somebody's clapping. I think, I think you should clap for that for sure because that was, that was a lot of labor for our guitarist uh, over here. Andrew Boyce uh, did all of, all of that and spent hours and hours and hours on it. But that is the result of our prayer challenge from last month's message on transformational 
prayer. We ask you to make a commitment to pray where you live, work, and play, and then to fill in those addresses. And so Andrew mapped out those addresses, drilled small holes uh, over there. And so as you look at the map, there's light shining into the places where people are, are praying. And it's just a, a great visual for us to see what our prayer footprint is uh, around our city. In fact, it extends beyond the borders. It goes as far west as California and as far south as Florida. So if you're watching and you need me to come and pray with you, I'm available. I just want to say. Uh, so that I'm so grateful for, for all of you and all of you online who are committing to pray in those spaces. And so if you uh, didn't make a commitment to that or you missed all that, you can scan this QR code. You can fill it out. And as you fill out the addresses, we'll continue to drill little holes so that light keeps shining uh, through as we expand our prayer footprint around the greater Cincinnati, uh, Dayton area. We are committed to leaning into the power of prayer. That's one of the ways that we're doing that. The other way is through our prayer and worship night on the second Monday of every month. That happens to be tomorrow night. We'll be in the multi-purpose room right across uh, the hall here uh, in the lobby, uh, on the other side of the lobby, at, from 6 to 7.30. Come when you can. Stay as long uh, as you can, but it's kind of an open house of prayer. Jacob will lead us through some songs and then we'll, we'll go through some guided prayer prompts. So we'll kind of guide uh, most of that time. And then we'll have, uh, we'll have some uh, free-for-all prayer uh, as well. But we would love for you to be part of that. Come and join that. Pray uh, for our church family together. Nothing bends the ear of God more than when his people gather together and pray. And so that's really what we're going for uh, on these uh, nights. I hope you'll do that. The second thing that I want to I highlight, I've been dreading for over a month now. Uh, and that's the announcement that many of you read on Friday in the church email of Tammy's retirement. And uh, I am so mad at her. And I mean, I mean, I'm so glad for her. That's what I meant to say. I'm so glad for her. <clears throat> I'm really sad for us as a church. Uh, but I'm also really glad for her. She's made an indelible mark here. You, you, you really can't quantify the impact that Tammy has made in her last 20 years. And so we, we are glad that she's, she's come to this point where she feels like she needs to shift her focus, her ministry focus, more on her family. She is now Grammy Tammy of two. She had a, a granddaughter just a few weeks ago. So her family is, is growing and she wants to be available uh, for that. And we don't blame her for that. So back to prayer. We would just ask you to, to join with us in praying as we step into this journey of finding a, a CP Kids director. And Tammy will continue to serve at least until the end of uh, August. And when the time comes, we will celebrate her appropriately. But between now and then, I would encourage you to, to reach out to her via email or, or if you see her downstairs, just talk uh, to her and share how much she has meant to you, how much she's meant to uh, our church. And if you want to talk her out of it, I wouldn't be mad about that either. So... Okay, let's dive into Genesis. Now, if you weren't here last week, we kicked off this series uh, in Genesis 1. I would encourage you to go back and watch it because the beginning of the story is foundational for the rest of the story. It gives the framework for everything that comes later in the book of the Bible. And the point we made last week is that there was indeed a beginning. We, we don't believe that we just evolved from some single cell amoeba over billions of years into intelligent human beings. Like as Jesus followers, we believe the Bible gives us a better beginning that leads us to a better story. And so as Christians, we ascribe to a theology of creation, not a theory of evolution. We believe that the beauty and mystery of this world, it cries out for a creator, that the intricacy and capacity and creativity of the, the human body and mind, it demands a designer, that there's an order and a design to the universe and to human beings that insist on intentionality. Psalm 19 says, the heavens declare the glory of God. The expanse proclaims the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour out speech. Night after night, they communicate knowledge, which means this, that everything in creation points to a creator and tells us that he is good. Now, within the theology of creation, there are different views of how God created. One view is called theistic evolution, which is the idea that God created the world and everything in it 
through the evolutionary process. So he used evolution to bring all of this uh, about. That's one theory. There's old earth creationism uh, where, where the days of Genesis aren't literal 24-hour days, but they represent a much longer period of time, making the earth around four and a half billion years old. Then there's young earth creationism that believes that God did create the world in six literal days and that the, the, the age of the earth is actually more like 6,000 to 10,000 years old. The reason there are so many views on creation is because the Bible doesn't tell us specifically how God created, which should also tell us something, that that's not really what we're trying to answer here. So we don't have an official position on how God did it. We would consider that as a church a secondary issue. The primary issue, the primary doctrine that we would consider essential is that God did it, that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. We hold firm to that position. How he did it, we leave that open. And the reason is because Genesis 1 isn't answering the how, it's answering the why. And as we said last week, love is why. God's love was too great to contain. He wanted to create a world where that was good, where his love would be extended and his goodness would be expanded. And the book of Genesis, and in particular the first 11 chapters, answer four of the most important questions facing humanity. We talked a little bit about this last week, but origin, purpose, morality, and, and destiny. The, 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 these four questions, how did I get here? That's origin. What am I supposed to do here? That's purpose. How do I thrive and flourish here? That's morality. What's beyond here? That's destiny. And the answer to this is what frames a worldview. And so what we're trying to do in this series is help you frame a biblical worldview that will help you navigate the cultural landmines of unbiblical and anti-biblical worldviews because they're all over the place. So last week we made it through the first five verses of, of chapter one. I encourage you to read the rest of the chapter uh, and just to reflect on what, what brings you the most joy and pleasure out of what God uh, created. And so today we're going to talk about what brings God the most joy and pleasure out of creation, which ironically is the part that brings us the most frustration and the most heartburn, and that's people. The world would be amazing if it were not for people, right? Like your job would be amazing if it weren't for the people. My job would be amazing if it weren't for the people. I'm just, I love you, I'm kidding. I wouldn't have a job if it weren't for the people. But, but here's, here's, what, here's what we want to see in Genesis. That people was God's plan for amazing. People was God's plan for amazing. Genesis 1 and 2 are pictures of what God intended. Pictures of what God uh, wanted to begin with in the beginning. Of what the world was supposed to be. Now Moses, who most scholars believe wrote the book of Genesis is describing what God intended from the beginning. And it's important to remember who his audience was. His audience was not you and me. His audience was the Hebrew people that he had just led out of Egypt after around 400 years of slavery. As slaves in Egypt, they knew nothing about the God of their ancestors. They knew nothing about that God. They had been indoctrinated in a worldview filled with false gods and, and pagan worship. And so the creation account is Moses declaring that there is only one God who created everything else. There's no sun god. There's no moon goddess. God himself created the sun and the moon, and he hung them in the heavens with his own bare hands. And their view of themselves was that there were superhumans like Pharaoh and subhumans like themselves as slaves. They weren't given any value or any worth. So they would have had an incredibly low view of themselves. And so Moses, is, as he's writing Genesis 1, he is building towards the crescendo of God's creation on day 6. And this part of the creation narrative is intended to change their personal narrative. So 400 years of slavery, 400 years of forced labor, 400 years of, feel, of feeling uh, subhuman, and as Moses describes God breathing breath into humanity, it's intended to bring life to their story. So verse 26 of chapter 1. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Now who's God talking to? 
He's talking to himself, which is three and one. Remember last week we went back to John 1, where John says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And so Jesus, the Son, God the Father, God the Holy Spirit, they make up the Trinity. God is three and one. That's a mystery that we will never be able to understand, uh, but that's what is going on in this passage. Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. They will rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, the livestock, the whole earth, and the creatures that crawl on the earth. So God created man in his own image. He created him in the image of God. Moses is repeating himself, so this is an important thing for us to pick up. He created them male and female. God saw all that he had made, and it was very good indeed. Evening came, then morning, the sixth day. So everything was building toward this moment when humanity would enter into the story of God. Now, we've read this and heard this so much that it really doesn't move us that much. But I want you to imagine the first, the, the first audience hearing for the first time that they matter more than anything else. The group of, of people, that, this group of people that have been ruled over for hundreds of years, hear for the first time that they're actually the rulers of creation. And that this God who created everything from nothing actually created them in his image and in his likeness. Like the livestock in Egypt had a better life than they did. And now they learn that they actually have more in common with the creator of it all. This is a statement of value, a statement of worth, a statement of dignity that they had never felt and had never experienced before. And while these are ancient words, they hold a timeless truth. And the truth is this, that every human being bears the image of God and is worthy of dignity and respect. Every human being, every single one, bears the image of God and is worthy of dignity and respect. If we just honored that truth, it would completely and drastically change the landscape of the world we live in. Here's, here's what that means. We aren't defined by our differences, but by our likeness. We're not defined by our difference, but by our likeness. We bear the same image of the same God, so we have the same dignity, the same worth, the same value. This has significant bearings on our identity. That our identity is not defined by our gender or our ethnicity or our class or our color or our religion or anything else. It is defined by our likeness to God, that we are all children of God who bear the same image of God and who bear the likeness of God. This is a huge idea. So male and female are different in biology, but they are alike in soul. Black and white are different in skin color, but alike in soul. Rich and poor are different in socioeconomic class, but alike in soul. Christians, Muslims, Hindus, Jews, different in religion, but alike in soul. Republicans and Democrats, uh-oh. <laughs> different in party, alike in soul. Chief fans and everybody else, right? Just At the very essence of our personhood, we are significantly more alike than we are different because of the image of God that we bear. And my friends, if we were to make our differences secondary and our likeness primary, we would put an end to the hate and division in the world. I mean, imagine, like, we would put an end to racism, feminism, chauvinism, humanism, communism, nationalism, tribalism, individualism, and maybe even pessimism. That's a lot of optimism. 
But if we would focus on our likeness more than our differences, could it be possible that we would learn to love each other? If instead of seeing gender or race or ethnicity or religion or whatever else we tend to we tend to view people through, if we just saw instead the image of God in them, I think that we would love them more. In fact, the only difference Moses mentions is gender because that difference is necessary for the creation mandate that he gives them to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. There's only one way to accomplish that commandment. And the irony is that's the difference we've taken off the table. So the creation story, there is no distinction among people other than male and female. That's telling us something. And here's what that's telling us, that human distinctions are our creation, not God's. We made the distinction, not God. That doesn't mean that God didn't create diversity. He absolutely did. We'll get to that in Genesis 10 and 11. But we took diversity and and we created distinctions. And instead of focusing on how we are alike, we began to draw lines around how we are different. And so if you don't look like me, talk like me, act like me, think like me, believe like me, then you're not part of me at all. And so we're just all part of a little tribe somewhere that just is an echo chamber where we all just look alike. But the reality is we are all alike. I mean, think of some of the greatest atrocities in the history of the world. It came because of this idea that Hitler led a nation to believe that an entire group of people was less than human because of their distinct religion and six million Jews were wiped off the face of the earth. On our own soil, slavery of African Americans was an institution because of the distinct color of their skin. They were not seen as people, but as property. They were sold as goods and services instead of being held with dignity and respect. Their value was not determined by the image of their creator, but by the pocketbook of their owner. And in our own day, we have created a distinction between a fetus and a human life. Despite the fact that by week 12 of pregnancy, a fetus has all the major organs and systems of a human life. And so the question, I guess, is at what point do they bear the image of God? When does that show up? Psalm 139, 18 says, you saw me when I was formless. You saw me when I was formless. All my days were written in your book and planned before a single one of them came to be. And so what we call a fetus, God calls an image bearer. That he sees a reflection of himself before we can even hear a heartbeat. See, being created in the image of God means there is a sacredness to every human life that must be honored without distinction. Without distinction. So much so that Jesus moved the bar for human dignity from don't murder people to don't be angry with people. That's quite a leap. That tells us something, doesn't it? That people are God's greatest pleasure. And that God is most glorified in us when we treat his people with the utmost dignity and respect. In other words, when we love our neighbors as ourselves. So let me just ask you, like what would happen In your workplace, if instead of looking at your boss or your coworker with contempt, you looked at them and saw the image of God, what would happen? What what would happen if instead of looking at the guy who just cut you off in traffic as an incompetent driver, like you looked at him 
and saw the image of God, you wouldn't honk at Jesus. You wouldn't wave at Jesus with one finger, I don't think. What would happen if instead of holding on to the hurt that was inflicted on you by somebody else? A friend, a parent, a sibling, an in-law. What would happen if if instead of looking at at them with anger and bitterness, you you looked at them and you, you saw the image of God? See, when we change the way we see people, We change the way we feel about people. I think that's what God's after. Is that we begin to see people. Not with distinction. But with likeness. With his image. See, we are created in God's image and likeness. Which means we have an incredible capacity for love and goodness. Because God is a God of love and a God of goodness. And that's why God created us male and female to extend his love and expand his goodness throughout the earth. It's why he commanded Adam and Eve to be fruitful and multiply. What God made was very good and it needed to be reproduced so that the earth would become this massive community of image bearers extending his love and expanding his goodness throughout the earth. And so in chapter 1, Moses, he gives us this grand tour of creation. It's, it's this broad overview of what God created. He's, he's talking to us about sequence. He's showing us a sequence of events. But in chapter 2, he zooms in on day 6. Chapter 1 is big picture. Chapter 2 is granular. He gets into the details. Chapter 1 answers how we got here. Chapter 2 answers what our purpose is here and how we thrive and flourish here. So we're going to jump in to chapter 2. We're going to pick it up in verse uh, 15. The Lord God took the man and placed him in the Garden of Eden to work it and watch over it. Now this is a statement of purpose. It's a statement of purpose. God created us to work And to watch over this garden as well as rule over the animals to subdue the earth. Working and ruling are another way that we exercise God's image and likeness because God works and God rules. So our purpose is to work and rule here on God's behalf. Now Ben's going to talk more about that next week. He'll come in and fill in some of these verses that we skipped where we talk about work uh, and rest. Verse 16, and the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree of the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for on the day you eat from it, you will certainly die. This is a statement of morality. How do we thrive and flourish here? We do it by being obedient to the commands of God. Spoiler alert, we won't do that. Verse 18, then the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper corresponding to him. I will make a helper corresponding to him. As Moses zooms in on day six, we see that Adam has some alone time here before Eve comes along. And God is not making a confession. He's making a declaration. I talked about this last month in our message on thriving families. That God is not confessing a mistake. He's not looking down and and sees Adam just kind of with his head down, moping around. And is like, well, that's not good. I need to whip him up a sidekick. That's not what's going on here. God is, this is a declaration of intent. That God was going to build a community For the purpose of mission, the mission was to extend his love and expand his goodness throughout the earth. And so this helper is not someone to come along and help around the house or to help him stay organized. He's not bringing in an administrative assistant to keep his calendar and to book his travel. That's not what's happening. Whatever stereotypes culture has put on men and women is not helpful because they are not biblical. The Hebrew word here for helper is a big, big word and a big, big idea. It's the word azar. It's used twice to describe Eve, 
and then 16 other times in the Old Testament to describe God as a helper. So this is big time help. This is mission critical help. That without this helper, the mission of God on earth does not move forward. Does that make sense? Without this helper, the mission of God stalls right here. So the woman wasn't a nicety, she was a necessity. Man needs another like him. In order to extend God's love and expand God's goodness. He needs another like him. So this isn't just about marriage. This is about belonging. And that's what's seen in in the text that Moses writes next. What he writes next is is interesting because it doesn't follow the sequence. Because you would think that once God says this, the next verse would say, and God made the woman. But that's not what Moses writes. He talks about naming the animals. Verse 19, the Lord God formed out of the ground every wild animal and every bird of the sky and brought each to the man to see what he would call it. And whatever the man called a living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all the livestock, to the birds of the sky, and to every wild animal. That was a busy day. And you know, I can look at that and see why some would believe in an old earth theory, because like, how do you do that? In a, in, a, in a daytime. But again, that's not the question this is trying to answer. This is trying to answer a different question. Adam was doing the work that God created him to do. He was being obedient to the creation mandate that God had given him. He was exercising his likeness to God by ruling over creation by exercising dominion, by bringing order to chaos, just like God did in creation. So the animals are distinct, and they need to be organized according to their kind. But we get to the end of this day. He he gave names to all the livestock, to the birds of the sky, and to every wild animal. What did he not see? Another like him. He did not see another like him. I think it dawns on Adam in this moment that there's there's nobody here that's like me. There's nobody here that corresponds to me. I'm here all alone. And so I think in that moment of realization, there was a code written into the human soul that creates a longing for belonging for all of us. I think Adam felt alone, and that seems to be where the text is leading us because look at the rest of verse 20. But for the man, no helper was found corresponding him. Don't just read this as a statement of fact. There's there's emotion in this text. Like if this were read as a movie, like the, the melancholy music would start right here. To draw us into the story. But for the man, no helper was found. Corresponding. To him. God was hardwiring Adam with an innate need for community and intimacy that every one of us feels intrinsically. We all feel it. That at our very core, we have this deep seated need to belong. Babies who were abandoned at birth, they they deal with what's called reactive attachment disorder. Not all of them, but many of them. And this happens because they did not uh, immediately receive the comfort, care, attention, and nurture from a loving attachment to their parents. That got bypassed. They didn't get it. 
So out of the womb, a baby has already this feeling that they need to belong. And if they miss it, if they miss belonging and intimacy and connection in infancy, it makes it really difficult for them to accept in in adulthood. They react negatively to loving attachments, i.e. reactive attachment disorder. And because they didn't get it at the moment of birth or within the, the, the next few months, they can't accept it. Where did that come from? Like, they didn't even remember that. How do they know they didn't get it? Verse 20. That's how they know. Because there's a designer that hardwired that into them. There's a designer that created us with a need to belong. So we were created with dignity and for community. And the very first community God creates is the family. So we believe in a literal Adam and Eve. And the idea was that this first family was to reproduce their likeness to extend God's love and expand God's goodness throughout the earth. We were made to be intricately connected to one another, not only because of the likeness we share, but because of the purpose that we share, which is to represent God's rule and reign on earth in joyful relationship and together extend his love and expand his goodness. That's why we are here. Verse 21, so the Lord God caused a deep sleep to come over the man and he slept God took one of his ribs and closed the flesh at that place. Then the Lord God made the rib that he had taken from the man into a woman and brought her to the man. And the man said, this one at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. This one will be called woman for she was taken from man. So Adam is blown away, right? His reaction right here connects us back to verse 20. But for the, for the man No helper was found corresponding to him. Like he felt that. And now he sees it. He goes, this one, at last, she's like me. And so just as he named all the animals, now he has to name name this woman. So he's scratching his head. He's like, you know, she's shorter than me, so she's not a giraffe. She's younger than me, so she's not a cougar, you know. It's true, she came after him, so she's younger. By minutes, hours, we don't know. He's like, I got it, she's a fox. (laughs) Wait, I already used that one, dang it. Okay, she's a woman because she looks like me, but only better. They are distinct Yet the same. And this is the only distinction God created between people. That there would be male and there would be female. But they are equal in value. Equal in worth. Equal in dignity. Equal in mission. They need each other to fulfill the creation mandate. To be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Man cannot do that without woman. Woman cannot do that without man, and neither can do it without God's design. So verse 24, this is why a man leaves his father and mother and bonds with his wife, and they become one flesh. Both the man and his wife were naked, yet felt no shame. Now, we're going to come back to this in two weeks. Because there's a lot here. And there's a lot of controversy. I don't know if you know that. And so we got to talk about it. 
And so we're going to come back to that two weeks from today. But for now, I simply want us to recognize this. That God created a family of two in order to produce a community of many to extend his love and expand his goodness throughout the earth. That is our purpose on this planet. And the way that we thrive and flourish here is by being obedient to God's command to live out that purpose in the context of community. People are not our enemy. They are our family. If the story ended here, if there was no chapter three to this story, and it ended right here, what would the world look like today? What do you think the world would look like? There, there, there would be delight in work instead of dread. Work would be a delight instead of a dread. You know why work is a dread for so many people and it might be a dread for you? Because we're working for ourselves, for our own mission, our own, own purpose, not living out the divine purpose that God gave us. Marriage would be a blessing, not a burden. Do you know why marriage is sometimes a burden for so many? Because we come into the marriage with the expectation of, what are you going to do for me? People would be a joy, not a frustration. Do you know why people are sometimes a frustration? Because we have this view that other people are here to serve us. And so if, if you're not serving my purpose, well, then you're just a frustration. See, all of this results from just pure selfishness. And that is the core of so much of the conflict in our world. Because we have taken center stage and somehow have come to believe that all of this is about us. That will lead to pure misery. That is not the story God was writing. You think globally like there would be no war, right? Right? What's there to fight about? Like our focus would be on our likeness, not on our difference. There, there, there would be no more isms, no racism, because there's only one race. That's the human race. There, there would be no individualism, because I would know instinctively that in order to thrive and flourish, I need you in my life. There would be no skepticism, because... We would trust people's words and their actions and their intentions. There'd be no abortion because every baby is another image bearer coming into the world to extend God's love and expand God's goodness throughout the earth. That is the world God created. But it is not the world in which we live. So there's a problem. And we all feel it. And the good news of the rest of the Bible is there is a solution to the problem. And it came of all places. That a young girl named Mary 
was pregnant. Not just with an image bearer of God, but with God himself, bone of our bone, flesh of our flesh, because he refused to let chapter 3 be the end of the story, and he kept writing until eventually Jesus stepped into the story to point us back to chapter 2, to show us what God's love and goodness actually looks like. And so in John 1 that we read last week that I referenced earlier where he said, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, he goes down into verse 14 and says, the Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us, and we have seen his glory. We have seen his love and his goodness. Like Jesus came to show us what it looked like. And so he welcomed prostitutes and tax collectors and sinners because every single person deserves respect regardless of what they've done. He touched the sick and the diseased and the leprous to show us that every single person has value regardless of their circumstances. And then he gave his life on a cross to show us that every single person has infinite worth. Listen, because there's a chapter three in our story, because of our own disobedience, we are not worthy of such love and goodness, but such love and goodness tells us we are not worthless. We are not worthless. That the image of God in us means we mattered enough for a cross. So right now we're going to reflect on that moment just like we do every week. Where we take communion, this piece of bread that represents the body of Christ, this cup that represents his blood poured out for us if you need a packet, you can raise your hand. Our ushers will get one to you. But in this moment, I want you just to spend some time at the foot of the cross and reflect on the fact that you, you are worth the life of the Creator. Thank you, God, for this beautiful moment that shows us and that defines what we are worth. continue to worship.
nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus. We didn't want heaven without us. So Jesus, you
brought me out of darkness you have filled me with peace giver of mercy you're my help in time of need lord i can't help but see you're faithful so trustworthy. God, we believe that you are good and that your promises are true. And we can rest in that truth. And I will rest in your promises. My confidence is your faithfulness. I will rest, I will rest in your promises. My confidence is your faithfulness. Yes, I will.
Hey, thanks for, thanks for being here with us today. Just a couple of things before you leave. Next Sunday is Baptism Sunday, so if that's a step that you're ready to take, you can go on uh, our website on our Next Steps page and register for that or talk to someone out here at Guest Central and we'll get you signed up for that uh, next week. A couple weeks ago, I shared with you that we're adding two services on Easter weekend on Saturday night. So two services Saturday night, our regular two services on Sunday morning, and I promised you there will be an opportunity for you to sign up to help. And just like the Lord, my promises are yes and amen as well, because I'm created in His likeness and in His image. So you can, you can scan this uh, QR code to sign up. It's also out in the lobby as well. But if you're not already committed to a serving team, we'd really love your help on that week and especially on Saturday night. So take a look at that uh, for us. Hey, if you just want some prayer today, uh, we'll have some elders down front who would be honored to spend some time praying for you, praying over you. So as other people are heading out, you can head toward uh, the stage. Otherwise, uh, have a great week. And tomorrow night, don't forget uh, prayer night, prayer and worship night, 6 o'clock to 7.30. Come when you can, leave when you need to. Thanks. Thanks for being here today, and thank you for your contribution here at Centerpoint. There are many ways you can contribute to our mission. Whether it's serving in the second service or out in the community in your small group, you are a part of the mission to help people find and follow Jesus. Find out more about financial contributions on our website under Give. Have a great week, and we'll see you back here next Sunday. Hey, Centerpoint. In January, we collected a ton of coats while partnering with Serve City. Now, in February, we're going to be collecting school supplies for Project Minyana. This is just one simple way that we can show the love of Christ to others locally and globally. Come find out more about joining our June mission trip to the Dominican Republic with partner ministry Project Minyana. We partner in all kinds of ministry with Project Minyana, from serving kids and families through schools and medical needs to prison ministry. Whether a seasoned missionary or considering venturing out into foreign missions for your first time, you'll fit right in and find your fit on this trip. Join us for a monthly night of prayer and worship with our church family. The elders are meeting on the second Monday of each month in the multi-purpose room for a time of prayer and worship. Join them between 6 to 7.30 p.m. in person to pray for local and global concerns of the kingdom and spend time worshiping with others. Introducing Core Classes, your next step after next step classes. Centerpoint would love to partner with you in your journey of following Jesus and growing in your faith. We are offering two classes, What Christians Believe and Bible Basics. You can attend adult worship at 9.15 a.m. and a core class at 11 a.m. To learn more about our upcoming events or to register for any event, please use the Church Center app. To stay up to date with all the happenings at Centerpoint, follow us on social media.